All right, welcome everyone. Can you hear me well? Can I have some thumbs up? Yes, excellent. So welcome everyone to our episode number two of our Tan Sham Hong Kong Leadership Series, a conversation with influential and prominent business leaders of our community in a one-on-one -on -one conversation to learn about their companies, their personal successes and challenges, past stories, present, and what the future may hold for them. So for this episode, we are very proud to have Elizabeth Thompson, co-founder and governor of Can Cham Hong Kong, and the founder and chairwoman of the Ember Foundation. My name is Amélie Zencharet, and I'm the chair of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong, a non-profit, non-governmental organization that was created in 1977. And today we have over 1,900 members representing nearly 300 companies. And this makes us one of the largest Canadian business organizations outside of Canada and one of the most active international chambers in Hong Kong. So what do we do exactly? Well, there are four pillars we deliver on at the chamber. Number one, representation and advocacy engagement. Number two, business promotion, networking, and brand exposure. Number three, learning and training. And number four, information and insight. I would also like to take this time to acknowledge some key members of our community that we have in attendance. So as I look on my right hand side and see some names that I recognize, um, governors Madeline Behan, David Kong, David Nesbitt. I'm also seeing Alvin Chong, the head of the McGill University Asia office, uh, Kancha members, Dr. Sarah Barwain, Anne Copeland, Agnes. I'm also seeing McGill graduates, alumni Elizabeth Law. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're delighted to have you uh, on this uh, interesting episode. And how will the conversation unfold today? So I will start by briefly introducing our star guest, Elizabeth Thompson. I will then follow with some questions that I have from her childhood in Canada to what has brought her to Hong Kong. And we will end with an open 15 minute Q&A at the end. I also wanna take the opportunity to thank you all attendees for being present today as 100% of the proceeds from the event will be donated towards the Ember Foundation. And so Elizabeth, good afternoon, bonjour. Bonjour, Amélie. I am, it, it's a delight to see you again. And, and today, as I mentioned earlier, you are the founder and chairwoman of the Ember Foundation. It's a two-tiered charity supporting underserved communities here in Hong Kong. And before becoming a philanthropist, you were a successful entrepreneur who built and sold a multi-million dollar business. And, and so I'm very excited today um, to learn more about your personal journey. Um, as you know, you and I share some common threads. We both studied at McGill Law School. We both started in the legal practice before becoming entrepreneur. And, and I'm really, really excited uh, for me uh, to learn and for all of us to learn more about your, your journey here in, in Hong Kong. So I'd like to start with, um, with the beginning, actually. Uh, can you share with us where you're from in Canada? What was your childhood like and, and how your, um, your studies have influenced your, um, your career? I'd be very pleased to. And thank you so much for having me today. Um, the longest association that I've had in Hong Kong is with the Canadian Chamber, so it's a very special group to me, and um, I was pleased to be there at the beginning. Yes, um, I'm from Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is on the top of Lake Superior, a very isolated uh, small town of about 100,000. And when I was growing up there, I was studying languages, and it turned out that um, the next step would have been university and I needed an extra language. So I actually went to boarding school in Toronto to the Bishop Strawn School for Girls and did two years there before I started applying for universities. And the Bishop Strawn School has a special place in my heart because it really opened my eyes to many different opportunities for women 
that really weren't common in those days. I think that I had been told that I could be a teacher, a nurse, or a social worker. And really to think of being a lawyer was something that wasn't even in my head or around me. And um, I think that was the beginning of a really different journey to for me. And I eventually became the first international governor on the board of governors of the Bishop Strong School. And my daughter went to the school as well. So I'm still very intimately connected with uh, the Bishop Sean School through the women that are graduates that are in Hong Kong and through the school itself directly where I have a bursary set up as well. And, and from there, what led you to, to go to law school? Well, I didn't go directly. I actually went to Western and uh, I studied languages at Western and did my third year abroad in France. And when I told my father uh, that I wasn't going to come back, that I was going to stay in France, he convinced me to come back, which, of course, uh, was the end of my time in France. And I think he knew that very well. So I finished my degree at Western and I realized then that I was in the wrong line of work, that I really wasn't going to want to be a translator, which is what I thought I was going to do. And I had a conversation with a friend one night who was in law school, and I realized that I was very interested in what he was talking about. I was interested in how law was able to help people and where it would lead and I went home that night and applied to a couple of law school. And to my absolute astonishment, I got a letter from McGill accepting me. And that was the beginning. And what was it like to be uh, a female student at the time? This was in the 70s, right? It was. Um, it was. Um, it was a very unusual situation that I didn't realize at the time was so unusual. Uh, there were very few of us who were women. Um, moving to Montreal was a totally different um, adventure. Um, and, you know, it was just such a male environment. And I don't think those of us who were women at McGill really realized what pathfinders we were. And, um, you know, there were some professors who were women, but there wasn't a sense of um, sticking together or what would happen, et cetera. Um, so it was quite an unusual time considering now that all of the professional schools have pretty much more than 50% women in their classes. And it wasn't really that long ago. Um, so I guess we were door openers and we didn't really appreciate that we were doing that for other women who came behind us. And so when you, um, you finished your law degree, what did you have in mind? What were you looking for in terms of, of work? That's a very good question because while I was at McGill, um, I had part-time jobs in order to pay my, uh, my university fees. And uh, one of them was actually teaching French to new immigrants. Um, and another one was translating the new civil code of Quebec from French to English. And I really thought at that time that I would stay in Montreal. I had done both law degrees, the LLB common law and the BCL for French civil code law. But the thing was, uh, there were politics going on with the FLQ and it was becoming a very uncomfortable place. And actually, I think it's probably true to say that about 90 to 95% of my class left and went to either Toronto or Vancouver. And I was one of those people who left. So I actually wasn't too keen on Toronto. And I went back to Thunder Bay and articled with a local law firm and had an amazing experience. I did so many different kinds of law. I was in court all the time. I was in the jail interviewing people. 
Um, I did some work on Aboriginal land claims that I think were some of the original work that was ever done. Um, it was an absolutely amazing time. Um, and, you know, that was, I guess, the beginning of more adventures in my life, really. And so which adventure brought you to Hong Kong from Thunder Bay to all the way to Asia? What, what happened? Can you tell us about your, that story? Yes. Um, so many years ago, I uh, at that time, what you had to do is once you finished your articling, you had to go down to Toronto and attend the bar admission course for six months. It was completely unrealistic in a uh, province the size of Ontario that all these people had to uproot themselves and go to Toronto and during that time a very good friend of mine came to Toronto and we had dinner together and he had left uh, Toronto and moved to Hong Kong because he was chasing the love of his life and he said something to me he said you know, before you go back to Thunder Bay and spend the rest of your life doing a general practice, you should really come to Hong Kong. Well, I thought that was a completely ridiculous idea. And, but I thought about it later and I thought, yes, you know, if I end up back in Thunder Bay, it's going to be for life and I better get some more adventure under my belt. Previously, I'd been in France. I had worked in England and I, I'd done a bit of traveling. So I booked a ticket and the day that I was called to the bar in Toronto, I turned to my parents and said, next week I'm flying to Hong Kong. I, I actually later felt rather sorry for them because I think that they were so shocked that I should have said it when they were sitting down. But anyway, so I went to New York. I got on a plane that was a charter. Uh, it had so many Chinese people on the plane. I'd never seen so many Chinese people in my whole life. Um, and I ended up meeting somebody on the plane. Those were the days when you stood at the back and you had a drink. And if you smoked, you had a cigarette. Can you imagine that today that you smoked in the plane? And um, he invited me to a party for his agent and he was a lawyer who had become an entrepreneur. And when I got to the party, the man started asking me all these questions. How many languages do you speak? What countries have you lived in? What law degrees do you have? And I said to him, Jeffrey, is this a job interview? And he said, yes, it is. And I jumped and I said, wow, what, what do you mean? What's the job? And he said, come to my office tomorrow. I went to his office. He had gotten his Hong Kong company involved in an international bankruptcy that in 1977 involved the People's Republic of China, Taiwan, uh, Canada, US, Switzerland, Austria. And he hired me to handle that international bankruptcy. Of course, I was quite a bit cheaper than Baker and McKenzie, so there might have been a good reason why he hired me <laughs> without any experience whatsoever. And I went around the world three times that summer. I remember getting to Montreal and calling my mother and she said, where are you? You're in Montreal, you're not supposed to be back yet. And she said, oh dear, you better talk to your father. <laughs> I, I always remember her saying that because she was so puzzled about what I did. I had the most amazing experience. And one of the things that it proved to me was that I had some business genes that I didn't really know about because this involved high-end ski wear. And one of the big things we had to do was we had to sell the ski wear because it was piled up in uh, warehouses. And I think that really, for me, started to show me that maybe there was something called entrepreneurship in my blood that I really hadn't even discovered previously. And I went back uh, from Canada, as Jeffrey, my then boss, said, <clears throat> he said, you've got a ticket back. You didn't even see the sights in Hong Kong. You left so quickly. So why don't you go back and look around? So I did. I went back, 
started looking around and then I thought, you know, this place is pretty interesting. I think I'll look for a job. Um, and as you well know, when you start looking for a job, you can never find a job. And um, I was the second Canadian lawyer in Hong Kong. And the majority of the lawyers were either British or Australian or New Zealand. And um, I, you know, looked and looked, applied for all kinds of jobs. I wasn't then a member of the Law Society of Hong Kong. And finally, in about November, I said, okay, I've had my adventure. It looks like I'm going to go home and be a general practitioner, live in Thunder Bay and have horrendous winters and et cetera, et cetera. And about two days before I was going to leave, I was offered a job, which I accepted. And that started basically the next part of my Hong Kong adventure. And so for the second part of your Hong Kong adventure, this was also a legal job, right? You were a legal counsel? Yes. Um, I was hired to be a, a legal counsel in a small private bank, which no longer exists. And I worked in uh, the trust department. There were several of us. Uh, my boss was a very high profile, well-known lawyer in Sydney, Australia. And one of my jobs was to open new offices for the bank. So um, I would travel back and forth to Sydney, Australia very frequently. I traveled to Singapore, I traveled to Manila. I was in Manila actually quite a lot. Um, I ran a bank in Germany for six months with a German dictionary beside me. I traveled to uh, UK, Thailand. It was just an amazing job. In fact, at one point, I said to myself, I don't even know why I have an apartment in Hong Kong because all I really was doing was traveling. And um, it, was, it was a really fun time. And I was able to grow my department, which was the trust department, and had wonderful, amazing experiences. How did you become an entrepreneur? What led you to then create your own company? Yes, you know, I always say that in Hong Kong, there's kind of entrepreneurship in the air. And even if you don't um, think you're an entrepreneur, that many times there will be opportunities offered to you that will be presented to you that if you have your eyes open that you say maybe and eventually hopefully you will say yes so what happened is that uh, the people in my department were all Hong Kong people Chinese people who'd been born and brought up here and about six months before I start maybe even longer than that that I started my own company they kept saying to me you know you can do this on your own um why, why are you here? Why are you working in a company? It took me a long time to internalize that. It took me a long time to say to myself, yes, I could do this because it was something I'd never thought of. I I'd really always been brought up to think, and I think the law school contributed to this, that I would work for somebody else. And they just kept on at me, like we would have lunches together and they'd say, why don't you start your own company? And eventually I did. So can you share more about that company you, you first launched? What were the services that you, you were providing? Where, where did you start? Well, um, I started International Corporate Services Limited, uh, short form ICS. I started it in my apartment on Bramer Hill Road on my dining room table. And the two people who had been encouraging me to uh, become an entrepreneur, to start my own company, came with me. Uh, we had no financing and within about two to three months they left because of course we didn't make enough money to pay them and I was the one left and we 
used all of the resources that we'd had in the private bank, uh, the contacts that we had worldwide, and we started telling people about ourselves. We started um, creating marketing materials, um, talking to people. You know, we it's so long ago, we didn't have the internet. I had a telex um, in my kitchen. Uh, we used to listen for the clack clack of the telex to see if there was possibly business coming in. And I can remember to this day, uh, getting my first piece of business. Um, it was a really exciting day. And um, the person who gave me that business uh, was a lawyer that I had dealt with in Manila. And the company grew and grew. I eventually took on more staff. And about, I think it was two and a half years in, we were still working in my apartment, which looking back on it was far too long. And one day they said to me, you know, we're running out of space at this table. It was a huge square table. Uh, could we put a desk in your bedroom? And I said, no, no, absolutely not. Okay, okay, I'll go out and look for an office. I have to do something here. And then we ended up moving into a small office um, down in Causeway Bay near the old Lee Gardens Hotel. We ended up taking a second floor in that building eventually. And then we moved again and moved again. And eventually we were sitting in a lovely office right in the heart of Central um, by which time I think we had 50 or 60 staff because when we exited from the company in 2012, uh, we had 65 staff. So the idea of this company was initially that it was corporate services. You know, Hong Kong really has had a very strong company secretarial corporate services uh, tradition with very highly educated and trained company secretaries. And that's what it was. But then it grew. And, um, you know, it became very clear to me that a lot of the clients we were dealing with who were from abroad, uh, they were from all kinds of different countries um, and certainly from Europe, from North America, from the US, from Canada that these people were primarily importers who sold to big box chains. So they would sell to the Walmarts, the Canadian tires. And they would come to Hong Kong with the idea that they would go to China to their factories. But the problem was with the differences in law, in accounting systems, in banking styles, they would very often spend a great deal of time running from professional services office to professional services, running from the bank to the accounting firm to the lawyers. And I remember very clearly one lovely client who had long white hair, uh, was from California, and he was banging the table in one of my boardrooms. And he said, you know, I've spent the whole week running from this office to that office. I can't hardly understand what these people say I should be in the factory manufacturing my teddy bears. And it occurred to me, you know, we're not doing these people any favors because we're saying to ourselves, we're company secretaries, we're lawyers. I said, it's very simple. We need all these services under one roof. And that is what happened. We expanded and we became, we hired accountants. We had tax advisors. Uh, we had people doing the accounting. We had bankers coming to our office, opening the bank accounts right in our office. And then we added on our trade services where we would manage and run the back office trade part for these companies so that they could spend the majority of their time either back home in Canada or the US or the UK and we would be running the company in Hong Kong for them and really weren't running their international operations. Um, and when they came to Hong Kong, it meant that their time was well spent in the factories because obviously if they couldn't get the right products, um, nothing else would have happened. 
and um, you know they would have had complaints from Walmart, Canadian Tire, etc. So that's really it was really an overarching consultancy that was focused on those clients who used Hong Kong either as a gateway to China or really what Hong Kong used to be, which was a gateway to the world for trade. And so what you really built is a one-stop shop um, providing corporate services so that executives in these companies could really focus on the essential, right? Doing business. And I, I'm very curious to know, Elizabeth, what was the environment like in Hong Kong at the time, especially for a female entrepreneur? Did you have mentors? Did you get involved with chambers? Um, what was it like for you at the time? Well, I was definitely involved with the Canadian Chamber because I wrote the constitution for the Canadian Chamber because when I joined it, I was certainly the only woman on the board and it was called the Canadian Business Association. I remember us having lengthy discussions about whether we should become a chamber. I think the interesting thing um, at that time uh, was that I was involved with a group of, of women lawyers. And, um, you know, it was fascinating to me that I had come from McGill Law School where there were very few women students, there were very few women professors, and yet I walked into a room and there were women lawyers there and women barristers, women solicitors and barristers who had gray hair. And they had been practicing law here for years and years and years. Um, I, I don't think I can ever forget that day when I walked in and said, wow, there's actually senior women here um, who have been in the legal profession for that time. Um, you know, Hong Kong was very important in those days for people who were doing business in China because so much of the business was done in Hong Kong. And hence, all the services that were here uh, were vital to these people, whether it was uh, import export agents whether it was the banking, whether it was uh, company secretarial, the majority of the company secretarial firms at that time were all owned individually by people um, who many of whom had come from other countries. I, I can still remember some of the names and uh, of the people who, who did that at that time. And Hong Kong, you know, was very important in terms of business with China, business with Taiwan, business that I saw where, despite what the Globe and Mail said, I saw papers in the very, very early days in my first uh, assignment where People's Republic of China and Taiwan were doing business together. And yet all the international newspapers were saying there was no business between the two. So it was a very, very fascinating time. And, and Hong Kong was extremely important um, in many ways because of its tax system um, for people who were doing business all over the world. We had clients doing business in Europe. We had clients doing business in South America, in Africa, it, it was a very, very fascinating time. You know, the, the life of an entrepreneur isn't easy. As you know, there are many ups and downs. Um, could you share with us moments um, during your journey where you felt particularly stretched and out of your comfort zone? Oh, I think as an entrepreneur, there's always so many of those. Um, it's, it's a little bit difficult to look back and remember them all. Um, I remember um, a couple of occasions that we had where things just didn't go right. Um, you know, when, when you run a business, whether you're in a large business, a small business or whatever it is, everything can't go right. You, you have to go in with a very positive attitude and really the idea that you're the problem solver 
that your chair has it printed on the back, I am a problem solver. And um, I remember one of the first things that happened where um, I had taken over a small company and brought in the owner of that company. Uh, because even back in those days, I was thinking, how can we scale up? What can we do, et cetera? And this person um, had been running his own company for quite a while, but one day he signed some documents that enabled one of the staff to steal money from one of the clients. And the client contacted me and said, you know, there's money missing from my accounts. And it went on and on. And, you know, we did an investigation. And he was a very, very tough guy from New York. Um, dealing with him had not been easy. And sometimes it wasn't very pleasant. And he said, I'm coming into town and I need you to give me a solution. And I knew that the money that was missing because we'd done all the investigation was about 150,000 US dollars. And I also knew that in our bank accounts, we had 50,000 US dollars. So I had to meet with him. Um, I remember just shaking in my boots, going to meet with him, this tough, huge, trader from New York who'd been very, very successful. And I basically had to say to him, I can't give you 150,000 US because I don't have it. But I had to give him 50,000 US dollars, which left our bank account at exactly zero. Wow. And basically, I had to walk out of there and say to myself, okay, I've done the best I can do. And I'll start again. And obviously, we lost a client. And obviously, I fired the person who had um, signed the documents. And we then started a, a lengthy thing through the Hong Kong police. Um, that was probably the first time that I was really stretched. Um, you know, that was a difficult time. And what kept you going? Well, probably the belief that the other clients trusted us, probably the fact that we already had staff. I mean, there, you know, you can't walk away from something that you've started building. Um, you, you just, I, I'm not a quitter and um, we couldn't quit. But, you know, it was very common um, years ago that people would try to steal your business. And it was usually staff. And I had another situation later where I had been convinced by this person who was an accountant to start up. Um, this was prior to 97, uh, when you know there were tons and tons of people who were very concerned about their futures, there was very little information that was coming out. Um, many of us were, were very concerned about what was going to happen after 97. And um, I had never been interested in immigration, but we thought that by handling immigration applications, which were to Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, that we would get a lot of trust work. Well, it didn't quite turn out that way, but you know, you sometimes have to take a punt on things. And he came in and we were running seven days a week, almost 24 hours a day. It was really a booming business. And um, somebody said to me, I was in Canada actually for Christmas and my general manager and uh, the head of my company's secretarial practice phoned me and said, I think you need to come back. Something very strange is going on here. And they had to phone me about, I think they phoned me two or three times because I, I really, I was having a good time in Canada. I was enjoying myself. And finally I said, okay, I'll come back. And sure enough, uh, what this guy had done is he had set up an office down the street 
he'd gone to the clients and he had said, there's problems at ICS Trust, and so don't give them the money, give me the money, and come to see me. And all of this, we were finding this out. And eventually what we had to do uh, was we had to go to a law firm, we had to get an injunction, um, we spent a horrendous amount of money on legal fees, but we shut him down. And right after that, I shut the immigration business too. I said, this is not a business that I really want to be in. This is, this is not where I see my future. Um, but that was kind of another kick at the can, you know, for an entrepreneur running a business is you've worked so hard. And here is this person who you trusted um, doing this to you because of outright greed. Um, mm -hmm. I think those those are a couple of examples. I think near the end, when we knew we were going to be looking to exit, um, because my husband had very fortunately joined the company in 1990. He had come back from Canada, and it was thanks to him that we were able to um, get this injunction against this horrible person, shut that business down. Um, but it was starting to be a time when staff were getting very difficult to obtain. And we had to have staff who spoke very good English uh, because all our clients were English speaking, uh, some were French speaking, some spoke other languages. And it was getting extremely difficult. Uh, Hong Kong had gone through a period where they'd gone back to mother language teaching. We weren't able to pick up um, the backpackers that came from Oxford and Cambridge, who were brilliant young people who could sit down and work and really help in a couple of days. And I remember thinking near the end, my gosh, am I gonna become the receptionist? Here I am with 65 <laughs> staff, and I'm worried about finding someone to be on my reception desk. So, you know, there's always lots of stories when you run uh, a company and when basically the buck stops at your desk, uh, you have to be the problem solver. You have to be the one that the people rely on, no matter whether you're having a good day or a bad day. Um, it's up to you. The buck stops at your desk, nowhere else. Mm -hmm. And so you sold your business in 2012. Is that it? That's right. Yeah, we sold it in 2012. And then um, my husband, Kishore, and I were corporate slaves for the next year. Yeah. <laughs> and at the time, had you already created the Ember Foundation? When and when, when did you have the idea of, of the Ember Foundation? You know, interestingly enough, um, we created it in 2011. I saw some documents the other day, and we created it, I think it was in December of 2011. We had been setting up a lot of NGOs for companies in Hong Kong. Um, we were dealing with a lot of international NGOs that were starting to look at Hong Kong and saying, uh, we need to be there. Most of them thought they needed to be there because of the huge China market. Uh, what they didn't realize is that the problems that would be created, and they didn't realize what the opportunities were for them in Hong Kong, which was, was a bit naive of them. So we had been setting up a lot of NGOs, and we were very good at it. We knew how to do it. We were getting uh, very quick turnarounds from the tax department, which is, is where you basically get your Section 88 to be a, an NGO in Hong Kong. And we had been running a little, maybe you call it social enterprise ourselves, uh, when my son James, who's a member of the Canadian Chamber and part of the Entrepreneur Committee, uh, when he became an Eagle Scout through HKIS, uh, we did a project with him, which was to collect airline kits and hotel toiletries. And I think we came up with that idea because every house we had, 
because we traveled so much, had airline kits and hotel toiletries in them. And we did a project with him. This is going back almost 20 years where we handed out these kits to the homeless in Hong Kong. So that project still continues. But then we decided because we'd had so many ethnic minority or non-Chinese people who were Hong Kong residents, many born and brought up in Hong Kong, that we wanted to try to help them. So first of all, we set up scholarships through Hong Kong Unison, and we currently have nine scholarships for these young ethnic minority young women who are in university in Hong Kong. And after that, we started working on um, different projects for the ethnic minorities, which have ended up as empowered by the Amber Foundation, uh, which is a program which is now, we're just finishing our fourth year. We have 39 young women in the program. And the idea is to make these young women more visible to future employers and hence ensure their career success. Um, most of them are from quite underprivileged backgrounds and getting a good career foundation, um, getting a good job is going to impact not only them, but their families as well. And these are Hong Kong people. Um, you know, this group represents about 8% of the population in Hong Kong. And uh, we want to see that the companies that are talking about diversity and inclusion are really including these young women. We've chosen to work with young ethnic minority women in our program. Uh, but of course, there's young ethnic minority men as well in this community. Maybe just the last question from me, Elizabeth, before I hand it over to the audience to ask questions. Um, you know, how can we support the Ember Foundation today? What can we do to help you? Well, from a business angle, and of course, the Chamber is a business organization, uh, we're looking for summer internships, paid summer internships for these young women. Uh, we've had a great outreach from some very notable companies, and we should place about 20 of the women this summer. But if anybody would like to put their diversity and inclusion uh, goals in action, they're very, very welcome to contact me directly and um, talk to me about what could be offered either for young women graduating or young women looking for the, the summer internships. And then of course, um, we're still always looking for airline kits and hotel toiletries, especially with quarantine going on and knowing that the hotels believe that they're required to throw everybody, everything in the landfill when you leave the room, that if you're in a room where you've got small toiletries, slippers, anything, we have 18 drop-offs around uh, Hong Kong where you can donate your goods. And we have 35 charities that are on our list. In addition, if you're working in a company where you have excess stock, we would love to help you redistribute it. We are just in the process of redistributing 7,000 bottles of shampoo from a company uh, that is sadly closing in Hong Kong. And there are about 10 charities that are just chomping at the bit to get these wonderful high-end shampoos. So there's two ways that people can really help us to accomplish our goals. Thank you, Elizabeth. So I'm seeing a lot of questions come in, um, a lot around entrepreneurship. So I will start with this one. Um, from Alvin, um, do you think entrepreneurship is, um, whether it's born or bred or a combination? And if it can indeed be learned, how does one go about learning about it? You know, that's a great question because I'm a great example of someone who probably never heard the word entrepreneurship um, before I fell into it. And certainly my 32 years running ICS Trust meant 
that virtually every day was a learning day. And certainly through the Women Entrepreneurs Network, I have spent almost 40 years trying to help other women entrepreneurs learn about entrepreneurship. Um, you know, we're blessed to have what YouTube and everything else, the universities offering courses. There's so many ways to learn about the various features of entrepreneurship um, that there's no lack. Of, in fact, I find it difficult to even sort through what comes into my inbox to say yes to this, no to that, because there's so many offerings now. There wasn't that 40 years ago. Um, so lots of ways to learn, lots of ways. I have another question here about entrepreneurship. It's from, um, I hope, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right, Mireya. Sometimes startups fail because the opportunity is not feasible for different factors as time, place, or business model. If your new company is going through a tough time, how do you know if it's time to step back and accept that your company is failing or it's just a rough patch where you need to keep pushing? You know, that is a great question and that's a really tough one. Um, I've been running some groups called Pandemic Survival Skills for the Women Entrepreneurs Network. And I think what you have to do is you have to find a group like that that doesn't really know your business, but can give you some ideas about what to do and how to do it. You know, we talk about mentors. Sometimes there's mentors, sometimes you have a mentor, but you need to have a group. You need to have other people. You, you need to um, ask for help. You need to get a second opinion. You know, there could be something that you are totally missing in running your business that I, not knowing your business and being on the outside, can suggest to you, which might mean that it would just totally turn the corner. So, you know, if you're not in a group uh, like the Women Entrepreneurs Network, like the Entrepreneur Committee at, at CanCham, if you're not in a group, then you're not doing what you need to do to have that outside input and, and to be learning about different opportunities. Sometimes we're just too close to everything. And uh, I know that um, I learned a great deal from a good friend of mine about marketing. I, I think now I'm, I'm pretty good about marketing, but I also helped her with all her legal stuff. She knew nothing about legal stuff and she kept getting herself into jams. And it was, you know, an exchange. And we would do that every month, have lunch and exchange that in not everybody running a company is good at everything. There's no doubt about that. If I hadn't had the support of my husband who came in, we would never have grown to the point that we grew. And so look for help, ask for help. Another question here. Um, I'm currently working with a founder who believes fervently in democratic leadership. That means he pronounces his vision with one liner, then walks away, literally for weeks. And we're left to understanding who deals with what. How do I deal? So the question is, how do I deal with this character? Maybe you should quit. <laughs> that sounds completely um, like this person is smoking something. Uh, I mean, you know, maybe if you work in a large company, you can sign off at seven o'clock at night and go home. When you're an entrepreneur, you never sign off. You never get a day off. Um, you know, this is, this is craziness. Um, you know, some people have talked about micromanagement. This is the opposite of micromanagement. This is really not even being there for your staff or for the vision of the company. I mean, many of us who are entrepreneurs would love the idea that we can just go home and sit on the balcony and have a glass of wine, but you know, that, that's not gonna work. When the phone rings and there's a question and you want some direction and you want some help with a difficult client, 
you as the owner of the business, you as the entrepreneur, or you and your husband or you and your partners, you have to be there for people. And especially in Hong Kong, people will quit on a dime if they're not supported. They will walk out. I mean, there is a very low tolerance here to stress and um, to thinking on your own. So I don't get this, but um, I don't think that this person is really an entrepreneur. I think they're a dreamer. <laughs> well said, well said, Elizabeth. Um, another question here, what tips can you share on getting through setbacks that are more personal? Well, that's a tough one, you know. Um, I tell you a couple of things that really help me. So somebody asked me once, um, where do you do your best thinking? And I said, I do my best thinking on the 15 hour flight to Toronto with a notebook beside me. The phone is not ringing. I rarely watch what's on the television. And suddenly I'm just freed. Somehow all that stress is freed from my head. And suddenly I have so many creative ideas. So that the other thing that I've said to people many times is get out and walk. Give yourself some space. Bowen Road, get out and walk. You know, if you're not doing things for yourself, you can't do things for other people. And I think that exercise um, helps the body in so many ways. Um, and it helps the brain. And, you know, one of the things that I really admire and um, really look for is creativity, creativity in business. Um, I spoke at a conference a while ago about how NGOs needed to be more creative in carrying out their missions. It's not just NGOs, it's entrepreneurs, it's everybody. And I think that if you do your best thinking in the shower, if you do your best thinking because you sing in a choir, if you do your best thinking because you go to the gym and knock yourself out, you have to do that even more when you face personal difficulties and barriers. You have to take care of yourself first. All very excellent tips. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm seeing so many questions come in. We won't have time for all of them, but I wanted to tell the audience that is listening today that uh, Elizabeth has uh, kindly offered um, doing a, an open forum for entrepreneurs in the fall. So stay tuned for Kancham to host an open forum where you will have uh, the opportunity to ask questions and we'll have more time to discuss entrepreneurship. In the meantime, I'm going to take two questions to end our, our conversation. So the first one is, what would you, what would you have done differently? And the second one, Elizabeth, is what would you tell your younger self when you were doubting yourself or going through tough times? Well, you know, Emily, I know exactly what I would have done differently, but it wasn't offered at the time. Um, looking back, it's very clear to me that if there had been offered a joint degree that was a law degree and a business degree, that would have been so perfect for me. That would have set me up for success at an earlier time, um, much more quickly, I would have had a lot of the skills that I needed that I had to find resources for myself. So that's definitely one of the things that I would have done differently. Um, I think one of the other things goes back to a, a, a previous question. I don't, I'm not sure I would have been so hard on myself. Okay, I'm a perfectionist. Okay, I I push myself. I, I know we wouldn't have gotten to where we had if I hadn't. <clears throat> but, you know, I don't know if I would have pushed myself exactly so hard. And I think the other thing is, in the early days of my business, I would have looked for financing so that I could pay people properly, keep people, 
and maybe scale up um, earlier. But that's looking backwards. I don't tend to look backwards. I tend to be a forward looking person. And as you can probably see from my resume, I've participated in, in founding many things in Hong Kong. And so I think I'll, I'll keep doing that. What would I have said to my younger self? I think I would have said, your life is going to be a surprise and you have no idea what's going to happen and just enjoy it and keep having a great time. You know, I, I like people, I like young people in particular to be open to things, to be open to change, to be open to adventure. And that's something that I've always looked for in the people that were, um, part of the great teams that I have had, who have, many of whom uh, have gone on to great things in Hong Kong. So I think that's my advice. Keep, keep it open, keep that sense of fun and adventure and, and look for opportunity. Don't let opportunity pass you by. Make sure that when opportunity knocks that you open the door. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, apologies for the audience who has not been able to, to get an answer to their, um, their questions. But I, as I mentioned earlier, there will be an open forum in the fall where we can ask more questions directly to Elizabeth Ops, uh, Thompson. Thank you so much. This was really interesting and fascinating. Elizabeth, you know that we both share many common threads. And each time that I hear about your journey, I learn something new. Um, thank you for being uh, inspiring. Thank you for the audience today as 100% of the proceeds will be donated to the Ember Foundation. And remember that there are other ways you can support the Ember Foundation through providing paid summer internships, 2020 internships, right, that are available in addition to providing toiletries. Um, for those of the audience, I hope that you found this event very ins insightful and inspiring, and I look forward to having you uh, at our next event and our next leadership series episode. In the meantime, I would like to bring to your attention a few CanCham events that will be held in May. Um, Canadian Residential Property Update on May 12th, a fireside chat with Rahit Talwar, CEO of Fast Future on May 18th, and a long awaited, finally in person greet, meet and greet, and the details will be available soon. And thank you again, Elizabeth, um, from Thunder Bay to Hong Kong, from uh, a lawyer to an entrepreneur, and now a philanthropist. We've learned a lot from your journey and your sharing today. So we're very, thank very you, grateful. Thank you, Emily, and thank you to the Canadian Chamber. All right, I say goodbye to all and have a great afternoon.